Welcome to Oxford News This Week. I'm Elgin Nichols. And I'm Terry Stiles. In this week's news, who's searching for the next village manager and a highly regarded resident will be greatly missed. And Pontiac Street is finally scheduled for repairs. Stay tuned. Learn more about these stories and others. The Oxford News begins right now. On March 31st, Village Manager Joe Young will be leaving the job he has held since 2004. His at-will contract was terminated by the Village Council on February 23rd. His at-will status means the Village could terminate employment without reason, providing a 30-day written notice was given. The newest twist to the story is the Oxford Village Council has formed a special committee to find a new Village Manager and Young has been assigned as one of the committee members. Joe Young was appointed along with two council members to hunt for someone to replace himself. Who ever said small town government can't be interesting? OCTV will report more on Oxford Village government changes as they develop. On Sunday morning, February 26th, Oxford resident Teresa Jerry Malash passed away after a courageous battle with cancer. Jerry was one of the founders of the Oxford Pregnancy Center and made it one of her lifelong passions. Jerry is also survived by her husband, Donald, of 63 years. The couple have five children, 29 grandchildren, and 20 great-grandchildren. Born in Newfoundland, Jerry was a registered nurse and a member of St. Joe's Catholic Church for 60 years, instilling a strong faith in God to her children. Friends say Jerry was a wonderful, caring person who was charitable beyond measure and widely respected by the community. She will be forever missed. We especially feel the heartbreak at OCTV. Jerry was the sister and confidant of our very own Dave Kenny. The Oxford Township Trustee Board recently approved $400,000 from the general fund to resurface 2,600 feet of blacktop on Pontiac Street beginning at West Drainer Road. The good news is Oakland County's tri-party program is expected to finance two-thirds of the final cost. There may be re residual cost hawking the project, such as deepening or widening of the ditches. So final engineering cost will be presented at the April Township Board meeting. Oxford High School sophomore Brandon Grodel designed a sign as a class engineering project which became a legacy in both Oxford and Orion. At the time, he had no idea his design would be selected by the Pollyann Trail Council as the directional bell sign located on the trail at both Clarkston Road in Orion and Burdick Street in Oxford. Although there were a number of entries for the project, Brandon's unique design for a trail was chosen as a representation of the old railroad bed where the Pollyann Trail runs. A ceremony for the Clarkston Road sign was attended by Oxford Township Supervisor Bill Dunn, Orion Township Supervisor Chris Barnett, Pollyann Trail Manager Linda Moran, and Brandon Grodel in the center of this photo. OHS teacher David Okazinski and Pollyann Trail Chairperson Mike McDonald. Looks like Brandon Grodel may have a pretty good designing future ahead of him. Congratulations, Brandon. And you can watch that dedication on our community access if you watch OCTV. The Oxford Township Parks and Rec recently hosted their yearly daddy-daughter dance at Devil's Ridge Golf Club. Daddy's little girls dressed in their finest and dads look every bit debonair. They all enjoyed dancing the evening away with their special girl in hand. I have a feeling both dads and their daughters slept pretty good that night. A Lakes of Indian Wood five-year-old boy was injured when he drove his bike into the path of his father's truck. Police reported the youngster was not wearing a helmet at the time of the accident and was transferred to a local hospital where he is listed in stable condition with minor injuries. Police believe an overdose of heroin was the cause of a 25-year-old Oxford Township man's death this week. The young man's body was found by his employer who was at the man's home to pick him up for work. When no one answered the door, 
The boss went through the unlocked entry and found the uh, young man from Second Street uh, not breathing. EMTs declared the man dead at the scene. Narcotics and drug paraphernalia were found on the kitchen counter and an investigation continues. An 18-year-old athlete from Rochester Stony Creek High School called 911 to report his vehicle was vandalized in the Oxford High School parking lot. The car was vandalized while the athlete was attending a game, which included a mirror ripped off and the wiper in the rear of the car was torn off. Police found the mirror on the other side of the parking lot, but the wiper was never located. Oxford, excuse me, Oakland County Sheriff deputies are reviewing surveillance cameras that were in the parking lot to identify the vandals. If you kn know anyone who may have vandalized this vehicle or anything about that, police are encouraging you to call them. Please do. That's it for Oxford News this week. If you want to learn more about these stories and others, you know what to do. Go to your local store and pick up a copy of the Oxford Leader newspaper. Or better yet, you can catch us right here at OCTV Charter Channel 191 or at t Channel 99. And coming up next on OCTV, filling in for Jamie Hughes is Cody Wright with your Oxford Sports. Then catch Oxford School News with John Ochins. And you don't want to miss Auto Talk and Science in the News with Dave Kenny. I'm Terry Stiles, and this is Oxford News This Week, where we bring your news closer to your home. And I'm Elgin Nichols. Remember, always be kind to your friends and neighbors, and thanks for watching. Welcome to American Legion in Oxford for the best fish on Fridays. That's right, from noon to 8.30, you can get the best walleye in Michigan. You can get walleye, mate cod, chicken strips, baked potatoes, and more. On the hall side of the Legion, oh, hello there, friends. You can have 12 friends on a table, any one of the best military museums in Michigan. And the dining side, oh, hello again. More comfortable with many four-seat tables and a couple of five-seaters. Now, on Friday, we have usually have about four to 500 best friends for our fish. Carryout, you bet. We have 50 to 60 carryouts at the post. We have some young friends with the birthdays and some of our best seniors at the post. Oh, yeah, waitresses. They go like a track waitress to get your food. If you have never enjoyed our secret, famous walleye at the Legion, come on in every Friday from noon to 8.30 at the American Legion Post, 108 on 130 East Rainer Road, Oxford. Welcome to Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication New Scientist. Do you remember the candy bar phone? A venerable mobile phone saw its reputation for survival further enhanced this week. Nokia's reboot of its 3310 model, first released way back in 2000, was the star of an annual tech event, Mobile World Congress, in Barcelona, Spain. The updated model has a color screen and camera, but still offers the classic game of Snake. Whether it proves as indestructible as its predecessor remains to be seen. Wow. <laughs> and on the climate front, as global temperatures rise, snow will melt more slowly. Yep, you heard it right, more slowly. Warmer global temperatures will lead to shallower snowpack in many mountainous areas, says Keith Musselman, a hydrologist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. That thinner layer of snow will be less likely to last into the late spring and early summer when melting rates are highest. Instead, it will melt away throughout the winter and early spring when nights are cooler and there is less direct sunlight, releasing just a trickle of water instead of a gush. So it melts earlier, but at a slower rate. The more you think about it, it becomes one of those aha stories, says Musselman, who used historical snowpack measurements and computer models to predict how the melting rate will change by the end of the century. A slower melting rate will reduce water availability for both human consumption and for ecosystems that rely on snow melt, such as the mountains in the western U.S., can you say California? And on the space front, SpaceX just announced a plan for beginning the era of space tourism. In late 2018, the space travel company plans to send two private citizens around the moon and back again. Like the Apollo astronauts before them, these individuals will travel into space carrying the hopes and dreams of all mankind, driven by the universal human spirit of exploration, says a SpaceX press release. But they'll also be driven by lots and lots of money. The two individuals whose names were not released will be paying an un yet undisclosed amount, but significant amount of money to be the first civilians to circle the moon. 
Nobody has completed or even attempted this journey since Apollo 13 in 1970. SpaceX plans to launch them aboard a Crew Dragon spacecraft atop a Falcon Heavy rocket, neither of which have been tested in space yet. The Crew Dragon is scheduled to make its first test flight into the, to the International Space Station without people aboard in November of this year. Its first crewed flight is scheduled for May of 2018. The first Falcon Heavy launch is planned for some time in early 2017. Given the fact that the spacecraft haven't been fully tested yet, let alone vetted for humans, a crewed launch in 2018 seems like an optimistic timeline. Some observers are skeptical. It's typical SpaceX bravado, says space policy expert John Lodston at uh, George Washington University in Washington, D.C. This is basically a George right. It doesn't advance any exploration objectives. It doesn't have any science value. It's like a big, high bungee jump. But last year, when SpaceX announced plans to send a Dragon capsule to Mars by 2018, the mood was optimistic. I wouldn't put anything past these folks, says Jim Bell at Arizona State University in Tempe at the time. Lodgins also points out that SpaceX has promised NASA a human-qualified spacecraft by early 2018 to take astronauts to the ISS, so the Dragon capsule should be ready for near-Earth orbit by then. Good luck. And back on Earth, fancy a cigarette after, or a coffee after a cigarette? Well, smoking makes you drink more caffeinated drinks, possibly by changing your metabolism, so that you break down caffeine quicker, pushing you to drink more to get the same hit. Marcus Monafo at the University of Bristol in the UK and his colleagues analyzed data from the smoking and drinking habits of about 250,000 people from the UK, Norway, and Denmark. They were particularly interested in people who had inherited a variant of a gene that predisposes them to become heavier smokers. The team found that people who had the gene variant also consumed more coffee, but only if they smoked. The gene variant codes for a nicotine receptor, which is not known to directly interact with caffeine. Uh, together, the results suggest that cigarette smoking increases caffeine consumption and not the other way around. There's a chance that smoking and caffeine consumption are linked through habit, says Manafo, but Manafo thinks that the uh, nicotine in cigarettes might also make smokers metabolize caffeine more quickly. In that case, they might need to consume more caffeine to get the same effects that a non-smoker would experience. Well, that's it for this edition of Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television. I'm John Ochins and welcome to the Oxford Wildcat School Update. If you've spent any time around our schools, you've seen signs asking for substitute teachers. I checked in with Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, Nancy Litowski, to find out more about this. We, we are advertising for our substitute teachers as well as substitute um, cafeteria workers, paraprofessionals. Um, we're definitely in need of substitute teachers and that's those are the signs that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, we employ our substitute teachers through PCMI, it's a contracting company. Um, and I'd love to be able to share for those who might be interested that we'd be happy to speak with them. Um, to be a substitute teacher you need um, 90 credit hours from an accredited university that offers teaching certificates. So. Um, several other criteria you need to meet are criminal records, successful criminal records check, and basically to go through the process um, and we'll work with you in terms of setting you up as a substitute. Now so. when you say 90 credit hours, like if somebody has a bachelor's degree in something or other but it's not education. But Correct. It, you do not have to be a certified teacher to be a substitute. If you wish to apply, here's how. Our, our school website, we have a link to PCMI. We also have under the school website um, information in terms of what's needed, what to expect, and um, once you get on the PCMI website, you can do an application process, submit your transcripts, 
and um, we here at the district work on the criminal records check okay. as well. So, is it appropriate to ask you what the daily wage is for someone? Currently, we pay substitutes eighty-five dollars a day. We are reviewing that. Um, we do have what I would say is a county and statewide shortage of substitute teachers. There's a shortage of more than just substitute teachers. Um, need classroom paraprofessionals. So um, paraprofessionals are individuals who go into the buildings and, and assist teachers. Um, sometimes it's a special education classroom. Sometimes it's reading um, various various positions throughout the district. Are there so. special qualifications for that? Uh, for a par paraprofessional, you do need to have, um, if you go into a regular position, you do need an associate's degree or pass the work keys test, but to be a substitute, you do not. Tis the season for orchestra festivals and there's going to be one in Oxford. Natalie Frakes is our orchestra director. Um, Oxford Orchestras has their uh, our uh, All City Workshop Orchestra Workshop, which is in preparation for festival, which is competition, and that is on March third and fourth. Will other schools be here too? Yes, other schools uh, come to Oxford High just as uh, as we're going to compete to com do the same exact thing. Um, but we are hosting as a school, so um, we have been doing this for years. So uh, we kind of have an advantage, and we're going to take that advantage and uh, use the stage with the clinicians and um, guest coaches tomorrow for our All City Workshop, and we're going to um, work on stage with that. Just okay. off the top of your head, who are some of your guest coaches going to be? Are they from around here or are they from nope. far? We, they're from all over. Um, our guest clinician is the esteemed uh, Gabriel Villacerda. He, uh, he is um, a pedagogue, a strength pedagogue from U of M, and he's taught all over, all over the nation, um, including places like Hawaii and um, I think he had taught in California, but he's been in Michigan for a long time now. and. Um, he is actually, he was at one point president for the Michigan Association for String Teachers. And there's more, including a Disney trip. We have our spring concert coming up in uh, May, but that's a while from now. And, um, oh, I'm sorry, we have uh, Disney. We're, uh, the Oxford Orchestra uh, Symphony is going to be uh, playing at Disney. Um, at the end of March. So. Oh, so you've got a big trip coming up. Yep, we do. Yep, and we're going with the band as well, so. Okay, so do, do you just like play a mini concert down there, or what do you do? Um, yes, we, well, we play, a, it's just a concert. It's about the same as we do here, but it's going to be at um, Disney Springs, which is going to be really cool for the kids to experience, you know, having other people, having um, people from all over the world gather to see them play, so it'll be really exciting. I think that Disney trip requires special coverage, don't you? That's the Oxford School Update for this week. This is Oxford Community Television, keeping it local. What's up Oxford fans? Cody right here to touch base on Oxford sports this week. We we're just about finishing things up for this season. Not a whole lot to touch on, but the events are exciting and the stakes are high. Let's take a look. Starting stuff off with boys basketball. Monday we took on Troy High at home. Freshmen started the night off with a struggle and fell to a final of 33-30. to The following things up, the JV club couldn't get the momentum back and fell to a final of 41-37. to Wildcats were struggling that night and Troy wasn't letting up. Jordan Jaden and his varsity boys tried to turn things around a bit and fell to a final of 63-51. to It's not like our varsity boys to, to fall in all three games. However, all good teams have their off nights and this is nothing to hang our heads about. Well, the girls basketball took on Rochester Adams the same night on the road. The freshmen took a dive to start things off early in the night with a final of 27-24. to the JV gals following that game up turned things around, switching the momentum to Wildcat basketball. Final score, 31-27. to And our varsity ladies fed off that hard work and ended the night on a high note with a win, 48-42. to 
The following night, our girls returned home and tipped off against Bloomfield Hills. The night didn't start off well when our freshman ladies took another dive and lost 27 to 17. The JV girls couldn't do things differently and our varsity girls just couldn't get things going as well and lost 46 to 29. Our gals have really shown another side to them though the last two or three weeks and it's been a different team on the court than we saw at the beginning of the season. Like I said, all teams have rough nights and it's the good teams that shake it off and go back to work and get things back on track. Well, our bowling program, as we have seen, brings Oxford most nothing but success. Last Sunday, all the talk was proven when our girls bowlers finished first place in the OAA Team Championship Tournament. You can't ask for anything better than that. Our boys had a great year as well and bowled some great games, taking second in the OAA Team Championship Tournament. I think we can all speak for, for each other when we say congratulations to the bowlers and coaches. What a season. Let's not forget the MHSSAA lay ahead. Like I've said, not a whole lot to report on this winter uh, for this winter sports winding down. We are looking forward to reporting some good news on our boys swimming as they compete in the MHSAA regionals and finals. Our wrestling program as it heads to the individuals bring back some titles to our hometown boys. Well, that should just about wrap things up this week. Remember to stay posted at OxfordAthletics.org for upcoming games, events, scores, statistics. Come on out and support these teams because the seasons are just about over. Also check out our website at OCCTV.org. You can check out all of our coverage through our YouTube page, which can be accessed through the website, or you can tune in on your local channel on Saturdays and Sundays between 1 and 6 for the sports coverage. We really appreciate all the support from all you guys, and we enjoy bringing you your community news. I want to thank you all for watching, and don't forget to tune in next week. I'm Cody Wright. Go Wildcats! Canines Stray Rescue does just that. Rescue stray dogs for new families. But they need your help. Become a volunteer at Canine Stray Rescue League of Michigan. Take dogs for walks, help them socialize with others, and help them get adopted. Fill out an application and help a family add a new member today. Welcome to this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication Automotive News. In our first story, PSA Group is betting that size is the answer to Europe's saturated car market as it buys General Motors' ailing Opel unit despite years of losses. The French car maker will pay the equivalent of $1.9 billion for Opel, its UK sister brand Vauxhall, and a stake in the local financing business. CEO Carlos Tavares, who turned around the maker of Peugeot and Citroën vehicles following a failout in 2014, is bolstering his defenses in a peaking market that's being transformed by technology, new competitors, and Brexit. Picking up GM's 1.2 million annual deliveries will allow PSA to solidify its turnaround by spreading the cost for developing new vehicles across a larger network while achieving the savings necessary to compete in a peaking market whose challenges include high wages, wafer-thin profit margins. Gaining scale is vital to mass market car makers as they try to stay ahead of self-driving electric car innovations and compete with new entrants including Uber technology. Bringing the two automakers together will yield projected annual savings of 1.7 billion euros by 2026 by combining development costs, factory investments, and purchasing. That will help Opel generate an operating margin of 2% by 2020 and 6% by 2026. Initially, the deal will be a drag with PSA's profit margin from automakers, or automaking that is, likely to drop to 3.8% from 6% according to an estimate by UBS AG. While job and production cuts are likely as the two companies offer a similar slate of mass market cars from high cost locations in Germany, France and the UK, it'll take years for savings to filter through. Implementing the saving measures will cost about 1.6 billion euros. The deal propels PSA to second place with a 16% market share be only behind Volkswagen, Volkswagen, that is, AG's 24% and pushing it past Renault SA following a steady decline in recent years. And at General Motors, General Motors boosted its incentives on its pickup models last month after its biggest foes gained ground intensifying a price war with the U.S. automaker's most hotly contested segment. Discounts averaged about $6,996 for the Chevrolet Silverado and $5,315 for the GM Sierra, 
uh, through February 12th, according to J.D. Power dealer data obtained by Bloomberg News. Incentives on GM's models surged 56% and 82% respectively from a year earlier as Fiat, Chrysler Automobiles and Ford Motor Company dialed back their spending, according to the researcher. The pickup segment is among the most profitable with the global automo automotive industry, giving car makers room to offer deals and motivation to make market share grabs. At the same time, fierce brand loyalty among truck owners means that automakers have to offer bigger deals to entice them to switch models. The rise in incentive activity also reflects the U.S. auto market slowing down following a seven-year streak of expansion. GM is spending 26% more in discounts on each Silverado truck than Fiat Chrysler does for its Ram and 85% more than Ford does for its F-Series, according to the Power Information Network data, which J.D. Power doesn't really release to the public. The deals from GM are part of a truck month promotion that includes offers for about 25% off the sticker price of some 2016 Sierra pickups or $11,000 and $185 discounts for select Silverado. The offers follow sales declines in January for both GM's full-size truck models while Ford and Fiat Chrysler pickups gained. And at Fiat, Fiat Chrysler says pricing for its redesigned 2017 Jeep Compass will start at more than $22,000, while the compact crossover will become the second most fuel-efficient Jeep after the Renegade. Fiat said that uh, Compass pricing would start at $22,090 for the base two-wheel drive sport trim, including delivery, with all-wheel drive in the sport model available as a $1,500 option. The mid-level Latitude model will start at $25,390, while the higher... Uh, Trailhawk all-wheel drive trim will start at $29,690 with the top end all-wheel drive limited trim at $30,990, all including shipping. The redesigned Compass, which is now built for the U.S. in Toluca, Mexico, is equipped with a 2.4-liter I-4 engine and one of three transmissions, a 9-speed automatic, a 6-speed automatic, and a 6-speed manual. The manual equipped two-wheel drive Compass produces the highest fuel economy ratings at 23 city, 32 highway, and 26 combined, while the same all-wheel drive Compass is rated at 22 city, 31 uh, highway, 25 combined by the EPA. The two-wheel drive Compass equipped with a six-speed automatic earned an identical 22 city, 31 highway, and 25 combined rating, while the all-wheel drive uh, equipped with the 9-speed automatic was rated at 22 city, 30 highway, and 25 combined. FCA said the redesigned Compass, which now shares a platform with the smaller Jeep Renegade, began shipping to the U.S. dealerships last week. Well, that's all for this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and as always, may the wind be at your back as you cruise down life's highways. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television.